Hello and welcome to our continuing conversation on developing our spiritual selves, uh, identifying our authentic and true self, uh, becoming aware of who we are as a child of God, embracing the fact that we are spiritual beings having human experiences, entering into our human experiences as a way to encounter God, as a way to experience the fullness of God, and in short, talking about what it means to be a healthy, holy, integrated person, a contemplative person. Yesterday I quoted from New Seeds of Contemplation, and I'll read the quote again because it's a good way to anchor us in the moment. Thomas Merton tells us, contemplation is life itself, fully awake, fully active, fully aware that it is alive. It is a spiritual wonder. It is spontaneous awe at the sacredness of life, of being. It is gratitude for life, for awareness for being. Contemplation is above all awareness of the reality of the source of life. Awareness of the mystery of who God is and how God is in relationship with his people. And so I talked about contemplation yesterday and I said that at the core of contemplation is the ability to enter into healthy relationships. In a relationship with yourself, a relationship with others, a relationship with God, a relationship with all of creation. And yesterday we talked about the relationship with self and we said that if you enter into the school, <coughs> excuse me, of your own experience, you can ask the questions that occur to you in your life. Ask the questions that are always there. Don't ignore them. Don't run away from them. Don't bury them. Ask the questions that you have. Trust in your life. Trust in nature. Trust in God. Have the courage to pray through your constant image of God, the constant change in your understanding of who God is. It is not a surprise for a spiritual person that their understanding of God changes, that what once nourished them no longer does. There's a more complexity, if you will. There's more ease. There's more comfort. But there's also an invitation within the relationship to continue to grow and to develop. Remind yourself that your relationship with God is not unlike your relationship with other people whom you love. It grows, it develops, it surprises, it challenges, it invites. All of those things are part of relationship. And then finally, I suggested that it's important to spend some time praying the roots of your life. Go back to those things that you find yourself anchored in those people, those experiences, those things that are important to you. For instance, this morning I received an email completely out of the clear blue sky from a, a classmate of mine who entered the seminary with me back in 1966. If you do the math, 1966 means we graduated in 1970, and that means this is the 50th anniversary of our high school graduation. And he wants to gather everybody together to celebrate our 50th anniversary of graduation. That is a root in my life, and I have to figure out exactly what that means. <laughs> I never thought about it till today. But there all of a sudden is the reality that 50 years has passed. So there's a lot to think about there, a lot to remember, a lot to recall. So talking about the roots of your life, experiencing the roots of your life, praying the roots of your life, are ways to help you understand better who you are 
and how you live, what work has been successfully completed, what work still needs to be done, and what are the new opportunities, new invitations that awaken you, that invite you, that ask you to consider and to join in. All signs of uh, our relationship with ourselves that's holy, that's healthy, and that's necessary. Today I want to talk about our relationship with others. And uh, I said that when we enter into a healthy relationship with others, one of the signs of that healthy relationship, because it's a gift that comes to us from the examination that we've completed about our own life and experiences, is the quality of compassion. We approach others with a compassionate spirit, a compassionate understanding. We understand what it means to be a human person, and we give each other the profound respect that each person deserves. And instead of being called to judgment or criticalness or all those other things that we might have a tendency to apply immediately in our own life, We've learned through the grace of God that that is not the holy and integrated response to what we've been given and what we've experienced. So we learn to be compassionate and understanding to ourselves. It's with that same idea of compassion, that same understanding, that same respect for the human process and the power of God's grace that we bring to our relationship with others. The Merton Institute for Contemplative Living, when it invites people to consider their relationship with others and to consider what it means to grow as a compassionate person, offers this insight and this directive. It says, contemplation is a deepening ability to respond compassionately to all beings in all situations in our life. It's not narcissism. It's not navel-gazing at the expense of ignoring the suffering of others. It incites an inner struggle against whatever forces within us act as obstacles to our being present to the needs of our neighbors. We clarify any distortions in our minds and hearts that allow us to misperceive and disregard, to overlook and to ignore, to make our neighbor invisible. So I think that that's a very powerful statement that the Institute for Contemplative Living offers for our reflection to help us understand that contemplation is an ability, a deepening (coughs) ability to respond compassionately towards life. In other words, it's something that you undertake. It's something that you learn. It's something that you practice. It just doesn't come to you automatically. Some people admittedly are more inclined towards compassion than others. But even a person who's not inclined towards compassion, who's inclined to judgment, can nevertheless learn the skills that are needed in order to become more compassionate. Uh, more empathetic. In the process of trying to become more compassionate and more empathetic, what you encounter is the inner struggle against whatever it is in your life that promotes you or encourages you to critical judgment about another. What is it in your life um, that challenges you the most? I think a lesson that all of us learn early in life and is well worth paying attention to during this experience of learning how to be compassionate is to see that often what irritates us most about other people is what irritates us most about ourselves. So we see someone else acting out in exactly the same way that we act out and we become irritated by it. So that's a perfect example of an easy inner struggle that we can identify and that we can learn how to respond to in a more positive, in a more healthy way. 
There are others that are perhaps hidden that we don't pay that much attention to, but nonetheless are present to us. And if we spend some time paying attention, if we spend some time in silence, if we spend some time in solitude, being grateful for the events, the people, and the experiences of our lives, the gentleness of the power of God's grace begins to suggest to us those areas of our life that we need to pay attention to, that we need to be um, more patient with ourselves, that we need to extend that patience to another, and that we need to be open to the healing power of God's Spirit. One way of understanding this is what it does is the call to compassion is the call to finding your heart. It's the call to embracing your true self. For some people, the, the true self is scary. It's the part of themselves that they know that it's there. They know that it really is important but they've spent a long time in their life denying that it's there. Well, if you spend most of your life denying or trying to push something down or trying to run away from it or ignore it or beat it into submission, it's going to keep coming back. It's going to keep coming back. It's going to keep coming back <clears throat> until you address it, until you embrace it until you learn how to love not only the parts of yourselves that you're willing to share with other people, but even the deepest parts of yourself that scare you, um, that make you feel somehow incomplete or make you feel anxious and nervous. So finding your true heart and identifying what it is within yourself that makes you whole and complete, that means your strengths, but it also means your weaknesses, uh, what you do well and what you struggle with, everything that you are. If you bring all of that to the table, if you bring all of that to the experience of contemplation, then and only then will you begin to experience what it means to truly be compassionate, what it means to truly be loving. One of the ways that you can experience uh, what it means to be respectful and accepting of your true self is to look at your friends, to look at the people who are in relationship with you, who know you best, and who understand you and nonetheless love you. You know, it's one of the greatest gifts that comes to us in our human experience to be loved by a person who doesn't have to love us, who doesn't have a requirement or uh, it's not something that you can assume, but it's someone who you just meet, who's not a relationship with you, who is no obligation towards you whatsoever, but nonetheless loves you, cares for you is concerned about you. That person, a friend, a lover, a partner, a spouse, that person already loves the person that you are, not the person that you one day might become. They fell in love with the person that you are. And if they can love the person that you are, then it is also a good invitation to see in what they love, to see how you can love yourself, accept yourself, and in the process, return that love to another. Another thing that happens to us as we try to become more and more compassionate, and as we understand that, is that we have to wrestle sometimes with real silence and real solitude before we can truly embrace compassion. We have to sit there with the initial impulses that we have, the initial judgments that we hold on to, the perceptions that we're convinced are true, and we have to slowly let those melt away. 
We have to slowly let the grace of God do the wonderful healing work that God's grace can do. Mending that which is broken, repairing that which has been torn, and helping us to see and perceive the reality of what is truly there. And in the process of being patient, in the process of fully learning to expect God's grace to bring light and life to that situation or that event or that experience, we become more and more aware of what it means to be compassionate. And again, as we become aware of what it means to be compassionate, we apply it to ourselves, and then we freely try to apply it to another person. Yet another uh, challenge that comes to us as we try to live in relationship with others is we try to gift them with the freedom to let them be who they truly are. You know, um, relationships are not a project. Uh, relationships are not something that you enter into in order to fix somebody. If you're going to enter into a relationship in order to fix somebody, to mold them into the person that you think that they should be, uh, that pretty well is a guarantee that you're not going to have a relationship that is sustainable. It's eventually going to break down because most people don't like to be fixed. And the fact of the matter is, is it's pretty difficult to fix another person when you yourself are in need of dramatic fixing. It's kind of like what Jesus said, when you take the plank out of your own eye first, you know, that's what you do. You don't try to fix everybody else or make everybody else the way it should be. You let people be who they are. And you try to learn to enjoy that experience, especially if it's an experience that is completely opposite of who you are. If it's an experience of completely opposite of what you think is important or necessary. I know in my own life, a, a little example, and it's a silly example, but nonetheless, it's something that's important. When I first entered the seminary, I, I ran into all sorts of people that I never experienced before, uh, a completely different experience of culture, of living with lots of uh, different men, and that experience was completely different than uh, what I was accustomed to. And one of the things that I really wanted people to do, and I thought it was necessary, and this is something I probably learned living in a family of three women, was that you pick up after yourself, you take care of yourself, and you make sure that everything is clean and um, it's, you know, put away. Well, that didn't happen all the time. And so I found myself constantly picking up after people, constantly cleaning, constantly moving things around. Um, and I would notice that people that I was living with would just walk past it, never experience it as something necessary to be cleaned or be, be taken care of. I noticed that there were um, some of the gentlemen that I lived with who later became my confers simply were totally unaware, totally unaware of things that I thought was important. I reassured myself that by the time I got out of college and into theology, that would be fixed. As men became older and older, of course, they would become more and more responsible in the way that I wanted them to be. But they weren't. And it continued in community, and it continues to this day. No one has the same rules and regulations that I have, when it comes to cleaning and fixing and organizing. Well, you can let that irritate you to no end. Or you can accept the fact that it's what you want to do. It's what you consider to be important. And you can let go of being resenting about it. You can let go of being worried about it. You can let go of expecting someone to notice it. And just do it. Because it gives you pleasure. It gives you a sense of accomplishment takes care of your energy. It takes care of your emotion. Like I said, it's a silly little example, but I've seen people and people have come to talk to me about irritating habits that their spouses have, that they are just absolutely bound and determined that they have to fix that. And if they can't fix it, the whole relationship is at risk. Really? A whole relationship is at risk 
because of a simple little habit that irritates you? The challenge to learn what it means to be free and to be responsible and to be compassionate comes into play not only in big moments. More often than not, it's played out also in little things. The everyday, the non-dramatic, the choices that you make every hour, sometimes every minute. But that's how you truly discover freedom, and that's how you truly discover what it means to be loving and forgiving and compassionate. The other thing that takes place as you be time to be in relationship with others is, and this is something that we've talked about in our first series of, oh, two weeks ago when we first started talking about spirituality, is to learn the difference between spirituality and religion and to accept the fact that it is all human beings are spiritual beings because that's who we are. We're created as spiritual beings. But not all human beings recognize the spiritual. They don't have the language of the spiritual. They don't have the connections. They don't have the experience to, dis to define or to describe what they are experiencing as spiritual. And some of them even have an inclination to resist letting anything that is truly be spiritual, even though they recognize it as potentially spiritual. They just resist identifying it as spiritual because they don't want to be identified as a spiritual person. So you have to you know, realize that those parts of that experience are there being spiritual, and then there's others of being religious. And it's possible to be religious, to have the practices and disciplines of a religious tradition, to be absolutely, completely an expert in the principles of that tradition and the customs of that tradition and to practice them per as purposely as you possibly can, but be devoid, absolutely devoid of compassion, of forgiveness, and be wildly judgmental, filled with all sorts of unmet needs and desires. It's quite possible to be both. The integrated life that we're talking about, the contemplative life that we're talking about, is finding a way to be both spiritual and religious in a way that complements each other, in a way that gives each other life and which calls us forth in a completely different way. And finally, one way to continue to grow in your relationship with others is to identify the people in your life. And for all of us, there are people in our life that have been essential teachers to us and for us. Maybe they were not even officially a teacher, but they taught us something about life that was important. And they're the only ones who have been able to successfully teach us that. I know that I've mentioned often that I've been blessed in my life to have had some extremely good teachers, teachers who taught me about the spiritual journey, who encouraged me to to ask questions, who encouraged me when I felt discouraged, um, who invited me to consider things that I, I never considered, uh, to challenge me in ways that I couldn't imagine being challenged. I had many teachers like that, but I've also had teachers that taught me just basic human life, basic human experience the ability to be persevering, to put others before yourself, to love in a way that you don't cow it, you just love, you just do it. Uh, there are many, many teachers in my life, and I don't want to embarrass any single one of them by mentioning who they are, but I think they know who they are. I hope that I've been able to tell them in my own way and in my own life, how much I love them and how much I care for them. It's good to spend time in prayer and in reflection, thinking about uh, the people that you care about, the people that you love, uh, the people that are uh, full of life for you and lead you to life. The other day, Father Chung and I were talking and uh, I told him that I said, it came to me that I know more redemptorists 
who are dead than alive. Uh, that might seem like a, a startling statement, but when I thought about it and I was thinking about important men in my life, important teachers in my life, it occurred to me that I know hundreds of redemptorists, hundreds who have taught me and who have cared for me and who have guided me, many of whom are dead and I can close my eyes and recall them so very, very easily. And I continue to be blessed with the redemptorists whom I live with and who are part of my community and part of my province, who also in their own way try to contribute to try to build up God's life and God's grace. The other day when I was preaching, I preached about the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of parishioners that I've met over the years. The ability that I have as a priest to stand before a congregation in certain churches, such as Santa Catalina in Tucson or Our Lady of the Desert in Tucson, and look out in the gathering of the community and see not only the people that are there, but also to see the people who are no longer there, but to see the spot where they sat in, to recall them, to remember them, to be grateful for them. So it's a good thing to revere our life's teachers, to be grateful for the people who made us who we are, and to be ever thankful. Anyway, somehow in the mismatch, or the whatever you want to call of all these things, finding your heart, finding God in your best friends, being willing to go to prayer and solitude and silence, becoming more free by letting yourself be free, but giving the same gift of freedom to another person, trying to know the difference between what it means to be a spiritual person, what it means to be a religious person, and then hopefully embracing the parts of each tradition that nourishes you and leads you forward in life. And then finally, as we talked about revering your life's teachers, all of those are the connecting points, the, the people and the experiences and the events in our lives that help us become compassionate. They teach us what it means to be compassionate. They teach us about how it is to live, how it is to grow, how it is to develop, how it is to grow in God's grace and in God's life. And I would suggest to you, and I think that you already know this, that if you really truly want to find God, if you really want to deepen your experience with God. You don't deepen your experience with God by withdrawing from events, experiences, people, memories, good ones, bad ones, challenging ones. That's not how you discover God. The same skills that you use to become a more compassionate, loving person are the same skills that you use to enter deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship with God and into a relationship with community. So tomorrow we'll talk about the skills that we need to continue to develop and connect with as we grow in our relationship with God and as we try more and more to become contemplative people marked by the spirit of God's grace in life. So have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow.